you're all very welcome to this, which is the first session um, of this workshop, um, which, as you know, focuses on global perspectives on um, teaching AI ethics. Um, just a couple of bits of housekeeping, um, some of it directed to the people who are who are um, joining us on Zoom. Um, if you are participating via Zoom, if you put your camera on, um, then that's you giving us permission to um, include that in the recording, because we'll be recording this on Zoom. I don't know whether we need to start that. Yeah. Stephanie, was that already happening? It is already that's already happening. Recording. Okay, good. Um, and if you leave your camera mm -hmm. off, then obviously mm -hmm. that means that you won't be seen on the recording. Um, again, if you're participating in Zoom and you want to ask questions at any point, I think the easiest way of doing that is to um, send the question via the chat function in Zoom. And then again, we'll feed that into the discussion. Um, if you need closed captions, again, they're available in Zoom, um, but I've been told to remind you that sometimes um, they're not entirely accurate. Um, what I found when I've been giving talks is that sometimes the closed captions are far better to what I've actually said, um, but maybe that's just me. <laughs> Um, and we're not, and this is this applies to the people in the room. Um, we're not expecting a fire alarm test this afternoon. So if the fire alarm goes off, it probably means there's a fire. In which case, we don't panic. We just exit very calmly. There is an exit um, here, and there's one at the back, as I think you know. So I'm sure that won't happen. But if it does, it will hopefully be completely fine. Okay. So um, this is the session that's going to focus on current practices around um, the teaching of AI ethics. And I've just got a few slides just really to provide a little bit of context and kind of set the scene. So I think what I'll do is just whiz through those really quite quickly. Then I'll introduce um, the um, panelists who will be participating in, in this first session. Um, and then we'll get to the, the interesting part, which will be the sort of discussion um, arising from that. So if I just quickly go through sort of summary slides. Um, so this event has been organized under the auspices of this project, Giving Voice to Digital Democracies, that's been running for quite a few years now. Um, if you're not familiar with it, you can really see from the sort of subtitle of the project what we focus on. Um, and really we look at um, the social and ethical impact of, of um, various kinds of AI systems that, that Often it's language-based systems that, that we, we really uh, pay attention to. Um, if you still use Twitter, and if you want to follow us, you can follow us on Twitter, but I know that's a dwindling number of people at the moment, for various reasons. Um, obviously, AI ethics is not a new topic. This is something that's been discussed for decades, really. So we're not pretending that this is some new thing that we all need to focus on. It's quite an old thing that needs to be um, reconsidered perhaps in, in a new context, and, and I'll say a bit more about that later. There's a lot of focus on this from users of various kinds of systems, and as we all know, these systems are becoming ever more available to, to you know, just the general public, certainly far more so than was the case, you know, sort of 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, and also governments are placing increasing emphasis on, on these systems being more ethical. Um, and to be fair, also a number of the um, most prominent corporations are also focusing on this. Um, but what does it actually mean in practice? Well, there's often a lot of focus on ethics around um, data and things like um, data protection and things like GDPR is quite right. You've uh, focused a lot of attention on that. Um, but I think one of the things we always feel the need to emphasize in the events that we organize around sort of ethics and, and these kind of systems is that um, data isn't the only aspect of this that needs to be viewed from what you might think of a sort of ethical an ethical perspective. Um, it's important, but it's not the only thing that's important. And one of the reasons why we're interested in language-based systems is that they um, present particular kinds of ethical problems. And again, I'm not going to talk about all of these in detail, but it just gives you a, a sort of flavor of it. Um, so obviously these are systems that reflect particular kinds of biases and um, often biases that are, that are present in the huge um, corporate that are used to train these systems. Um, if we're talking to them and interacting with them conversationally, how should they respond if we, if we say something that could be classified as hate speech? That's an ethical issue as much as it's a linguistic one um, and things like this. So 
these are issues that you wouldn't necessarily arise if you were only looking at systems that, that um, were focused on, say, vision tasks. Some of them may, but not all of them, perhaps. Um, and in terms of how AI ethics is taught, and here I'm thinking particularly at the university level, I mean, there's, a, there's an increasingly strong case that the teaching of AI ethics should um, precede the university stage. This is something that should be maybe more, more um, present than it is in many school level curriculums. Um, but if we're just thinking about this for argument's sake from a university perspective, there are plenty of master's courses in this country and in many other countries that focus on AI ethics. Um, these tend to be taken in my experience and in the experience of many of my colleagues, primarily by arts and humanities students. Um, so it's students who have maybe studied law or philosophy or even English literature and have become interested in AI and want to learn more about it. So then they go and um, take a, a master's course that focuses on AI ethics. The emphasis of those courses, it varies quite a lot, but there's often an emphasis on cultural and historical things, the kind of thing that arts and humanities students are used to considering. So take a, a, a phrase like artificial intelligence, when was it first used? What, what, are the, what are the sort of motivations for its creation? How has the meaning of it shifted and developed over the decades? Stuff like that. So there's often a sort of diachronic perspective, which is a perfectly valuable one. And often the assessment method is um, essay-based rather than involving any kind of coding component. Um, and again, in my experience and the experience of many of my colleagues, um, these are courses that are rarely taken by the students of, say, computer science or information engineering or other disciplines who are actually going to go on to become the next generation of people who develop these technologies. Um, I mean, I've been teaching in the engineering department here since the, the late 90s, and I think I'm not <clears throat> getting this wrong, but I can't remember a single one of my students who's gone on to take a master's course in something called AI ethics or something like that. So not a single one for me. I know we've got some other people that don't know Bill, whether you've <laughs> had any students get Bill shaking his head. So, you know, we're not a scientific <laughs> survey, but <laughs> we've both been teaching it quite some time. Um, so it almost seems as if there's a, there's a gap there, that there's a whole generation of students who perhaps aren't um, being encouraged to think about these things in a sufficiently adequate way. Um, and so it seems as if, you know, at the university level in this country and other countries, the way that AI ethics is taught to, to science students broadly conceived at university, that, that's an important thing to get right. And of course, it's no longer the case that the only students who um, are relevant here are the computer science students. I mean, maybe if we were having this conversation in the 80s or even 90s, that would have made a great deal of sense. I think it, it's clear that the kind of rise and sprawl of what we might loosely think of as AI um, has meant that many of these techniques and methods are now developed in faculties and departments that aren't officially just labeled computer science. I've listed some of them here. This isn't exhaustive at all, but things like you know, computational biology has emerged as a huge area in, in the natural sciences. Um, things like you know, even chemistry and physics are, are using these techniques. Um, and even mathematicians are increasingly becoming focused on some of these, these, these methods. So I think, you know, if we just focus on computer science students, we're probably missing as much as sort of 60 percent of all the students who are relevant here. So how should AI ethics be taught at university? Can I just ask a quick question? Sure. Slides will be available we can we can certainly make them available and put them on the website yes, afterwards. Yeah, yeah. Um, so how should AI ethics be taught at university to this loose cluster of people that we might think of broadly as technologists? That's a word that's being used increasingly. Um, well, organizations like the Mozilla Foundation have already started outlining ways in which um, AI, AI ethics might be incorporated into some of these science courses. And that's maybe something that we'll hear a bit more about during, during the workshop today. And I'm hoping today that, that some of our panelists will be able to speak from their own experience of how they're currently teaching um, these sort of courses and to sort of, I guess, get things started with this sort of inevitably sort of anecdotal case study type approach. I thought I'd just say something about some of the teaching that I'm currently doing in the computer lab here in Cambridge um, that focuses specifically on this. I'll just whiz through this quickly. I'm not saying this is an example of best practice. Um, I'm sure this is suboptimal in all sorts of ways. It has to fit in with various constraints of how the teaching there works. But it's just one example, and hopefully we'll hear other examples today, and hopefully better examples 
Um, so this is just briefly how I approach teaching one module for the Masters, the MPhil course in Advanced Computer Science at the Computer Lab. Um, it's a module called Bias in Dataset, so it only mm -hmm. looks at bias really. Um, it could be much broader, but again, there are constraints. Um, hopefully, I don't need to remind most people here that bias is, is a significant um, aspect of um, the construction of these systems. This is just a little graphic from a recent paper by Dirk Hovey, um, some of you may know Dirk, um, and it basically just identifies several sources of bias, so things like label bias, if you're using label data, it, it depends who the people are who are doing the labeling, but that can introduce bias, the sampling bias and semantic bias, modeling bias, so if you use a particular objective function, if you're building a, a, a neural net or training a neural net, that might result in bias. And then there can be system design bias. Okay, so bias manifests itself in all sorts of different ways. And it's important that the students who are developing these kinds of systems in the future learn ways of, of mitigating those biases. Um, so the way I approach it, at least in the teaching I do, um, I give some initial lectures that speak in some detail about various ethical frameworks from which this can be viewed. And look, and, and, and I, I try to focus on specific case studies, you know, specific systems where bias can be seen as being problematical. Um, that's really a starting point for them to read various recent technical publications, I mean journal articles and conference papers, that kind of thing, that address particular issues relating to bias. So things like what are the metrics that we use to try and quantify the degree of bias, that's, that's not usually a trivial task. Um, and then if we focused on one like um, Something that we've done a fair bit of work on in recent years is looking at gender bias in machine translation. Um, how can you try and um, mitigate that bias? And in the machine translation context, it often means a system that outputs masculine defaults. So if you're translating the English word doctor into Italian, um, should it be dottore or should it be dottoressa? The, the latter is um, feminine, the, the former is masculine. It'll normally just output the masculine default. Um, which is a form of bias, arguably. Um, each student then has to give a little kind of seminar presentation. They summarize two or three recent articles. They point to the, the strengths, the, the weaknesses. They are strongly encouraged to discuss the ethical motivation for that being a significant task and, and the ethical um, reasons for adopting a particular mitigation approach. Um, and then they have a sort of project phase where they actually have to build some kind of system um, and compare it to the baseline performance of an existing system to see whether they can improve that system in, in some kind of way. As I say, it could be trying to reduce gender bias in machine translation system, something like that. And they have to write a 4,000 word project report saying what they did, like a little conference paper, really. Um, and that's all formally assessed as part of the um, bill. And so the way I've tried to approach this is that the practical ethical focus on you know, designing and building systems causes the students to think much more deeply about the kind of system architectures they use, the models that they use, how they fine tune or adapt those models, um, obviously the, the, the training data they use, um, and, and to put it simply, the, the code they write. I'd like them as a result of taking that course to end up writing code differently with, with a different set of um, preoccupations in addition to all the other ones. So that's just one example. Um, while those of us involved with this project have been reflecting upon these kind of issues, the one thing we've come back to over several years really is the parallel case of medical ethics and the way that's handled at the university level in terms of the teaching. Um, it didn't used to be an obligatory part of, of any sort of medicine course and medical sciences course, but it's increasingly become an obligatory part. And I think it's pretty hard to study medicine, um, I would say in most countries in the world where you don't have to do some kind of medical ethics as part of that course. And I think understanding how that was accomplished, where the motivation came from, um, who does the teaching, who, who makes decisions about what's taught and how it's taught. I think that provides an interesting um, kind of parallel really to what we're trying to do here with, with, with you know, AI ethics basically. Um, that's pretty much all I have to say. These are just some of the questions that hopefully we've already got in our minds and we can explore in a bit more detail in this session. So I think it's probably good if I get close to shutting up, but before I do that, I'll um, just introduce the um, 
panelists for this first session, and then I'll sort of hand over to them a little bit. Um, so in no particular order, although it may just be alphabetical order, I can't remember now, um, if I just sort of whisk through them quickly. So first of all, we've got Zoe, Zoe um, Fritz, who's here from Cambridge. Um, Zoe is a welcome fellow in society and ethics and a consultant physician in acute medicine at Avonbrook's Hospital here in Cambridge. Um, she leads the teaching in medical ethics and law for the undergraduate medical students at Cambridge and has been instrumental in developing that teaching program. Given what I've just said, it hopefully makes sense <laughs> to you why Zoe is here. So I'm hoping that she'll be able to sort of um, give us insights into how um, the incorporation of, of medical ethics has happened in that parallel domain. So thank you for joining, it's really great to have you here. Um, some of our participants are joining us on Zoom. And again, I'm, I'm hoping they can hear me. Um, the first one that I'll mention is David Liu, who's joining us from um, the University of Toronto. Um, he's a professor in the Department of Computer Science at that university. He's one of the key members of the team behind the Embedded Ethics Education Initiative, E3I um, project. That's a very cool acronym. There's a number of people here involved with projects that have very cool acronyms. That's one of them. Um, and that's based at the University of Toronto. And we'll hear more about that in just a moment because he's just going to give a brief overview of um, what, what that entails and what it involves. Um, and next panelist is also joining us on Zoom, um, Leticia Onyejebu, um, Professor of Computer Science at Fort Harcourt University in Nigeria. She specializes in AI, machine learning, and web applications, and she's published on topics such as risk management models for software development encountering zero day attacks where zero day denotes recently discovered security vulnerabilities that hackers can use to attack computer systems. Um, our next panelist is with us in person, um, Tintna O'Sullivan. Um, she's a senior lecturer at the School of Computer Science at Technological University in Dublin or TU Dublin as it's known. Um, she's closely involved in the Ethics for You, EU project, another good acronym, which is an Erasmus Plus transnational initiative that explores issues around teaching ethics in computer science. So really delighted you're able to join us today. Thank you for coming. Um, and then last but very much um, not least, we have Yi Cheng, um, who's professor at the Institute of Automation at the Chinese Academy of Sciences. His credentials relating to AI ethics are too numerous to list here in full, so I'll just select a few of them to give you an idea of his expertise. Um, he's a co-director of the China-UK Research Centre for AI Ethics and Governance, which was established in 2019. He's the founding director of the Research Centre for AI Ethics and Sustainable Development at Beijing Academy of Artificial Intelligence. And he's acted as one of the advisors in the expert group of AI Ethics and Governance in Health, organised by the World Health Organisation. Um, so we're hoping that, you know, between um, this, this group of people, we'll be able to generate a kind of interesting discussion around these issues. So I think the first thing I'll do is to hand over to David, David Lee from Toronto. If I stop sharing my slides, that should enable him to share his. Um, Uh, sorry about that. Can you no, hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, David. I think we can. Okay, great. Uh, and can you see my slides okay? We can see your slides, we can see you, we can hear you. This is going better than I dared hope. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Uh, me as well. Um, uh, should I get started? Yes, please do. Okay, um, well, so uh, thank you for having me here today. And thank you to Marcus and, and Stephanie and the organizers of this event for uh, inviting me to speak here today. Um, as Marcus said, my name is David Liu. I'm a teaching stream faculty member, uh, associate professor in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Toronto. I'm one of the faculty co-leads for the uh, Embedded Ethics Education Initiative, which I'll spend a few minutes talking to you about today. Uh, so first of all, some acknowledgements. So uh, this program is a project within the Department of Computer Science uh, at the University of Toronto, uh, but in strong collaboration with strong ties to the Department of Philosophy uh, and with support from uh, our kind of parent faculty, the Faculty of Arts and Science, as well as the Schwartz Reisman Institute for Technology and Society. I've put a link to our uh, program website uh, at the bottom of this slide, and I'll show it again at the end of, the, uh, at the end of my uh, slides here in case you want to check out our website. 
Um, before I go any further, I'd like to just quickly um, uh, just to quickly credit uh, the, the kind of the wonderful E3I team that I have the pleasure of working with. Uh, this is a mixture here of faculty, uh, graduate students, and postdoctoral fellows from computer science, philosophy, uh, and the Department of Psychology. Uh, and so while I'm the one speaking to you today, this is really uh, kind of a, a, a multidisciplinary and uh, uh, multidisciplinary collaboration and not the work of any one person or one department. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about our educational context. Uh, so the University of Toronto is a large publicly funded research intensive university. The Department of Computer Science is a fairly large department within uh, that institution. Uh, so we have about 2700 uh, undergraduate students enrolled in computer science programs, uh, around 80 faculty and, and hundreds of graduate students. Um, our uh, we also have thousands more students enrolling in computer science courses, whether at the introductory programming level or beyond, just to kind of round out their degrees and their other programs of study. Uh, also notably, and, and it kind of speaks to some of the things we're here to talk about today, uh, our, our departments, uh, pro, our computer science programs do not have a required ethics or responsible computing course. Uh, there is one third year uh, elective course, which is a computers and society course, uh, that's a fairly popular course, but it's not required for any of our programs. And so, uh, as a lot of you probably imagine, uh, kind of into this landscape, we were kind of becoming increasingly aware of uh, the need for um, kind of more, uh, more ethics education in computing broadly, and certainly AI specifically, but computing kind of broadly. And so this, is the, this was kind of the genesis of the Embedded Ethics Education Initiative. So here is our uh, kind of program objective, which I'll walk you through uh, very briefly. So uh, our objective uh, for the program is to develop and evaluate methods for endowing and empowering the next generation of scientists, educators, and technology developers with the knowledge, skills, and incentive to incorporate ethical considerations in the study of computer science and as a design principle in the development of computer science technologies and to do so throughout their careers, not just at the University of Toronto, but, but you know, with long lasting impacts. So, okay, how do we, uh, how do, we do this? What, is our, uh, what do we do exactly? Uh, so there are two main pillars of our work. Um, the first is uh, we kind of create and deliver a set of embedded ethics modules that explore issues and considerations and uh, in ethics and technology, and they're spread out across multiple computer science courses, ranging from the first year to the fourth year, uh, and ranging in various topics. Uh, I'll, I'll kind of talk about that more in a few slides. Um, the other piece that I'll mention here is that uh, we are very committed to rigorous peer-reviewed assessments of the impact of our work. Uh, this is for a few different reasons, and I'll kind of talk more about the assessments in a bit, but uh, we are committed to both making sure that uh, what we're doing actually has some sort of measurable impact on our students, uh, as well as trying to share our work and our findings of, with the larger uh, computing education community, as well as other education communities around the world. Um, and uh, I'll try to put in links uh, and share links with some of the work that we've done that we've published, and you'll be able to find that on our website as well. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit about our, uh, I'd like to spend a little bit talking about our program history. Uh, this is particularly relevant, I think, to a lot of folks in this room who might be, uh, you know, might be interested in uh, creating their own embedded ethics programs or who are also doing their own embedded ethics programs to kind of compare what our strategies. So we began in uh, 2020 with a two-year pilot. We were inspired by uh, Harvard University's embedded ethics program. Uh, we had um, Jeff Behrens, who's actually one of the panelists in the second session, uh, come speak at the University of Toronto, and I attended his talk and found it very inspirational. Uh, so from, uh, from this kind of insp inspirational seed, I guess, um, professors Diane Horton, Sheila McElroyth, and myself were three faculty leads in computer science, and we uh, received some one-time funding for, uh, for a kind of a pilot in which we could hire um, part-time a uh, small team of postdoctoral fellows and graduate students from both computer science and philosophy to help with some initial module development. Uh, we started small, so in the first year, 
uh, we developed and delivered one module in, in 2020 to 2021. That was in a first year computer science course that I was teaching. Uh, and so we kind of had a, a friendly audience in which to try out our first module. Uh, but we, I'm happy to say that we did expand to four modules. Uh, so what, the, the first year module and three additional modules in the 2021-22 year. Uh, after that pilot phase, uh, we needed to come up with kind of a longer term plan. And this is where we worked fairly, fairly closely with, um, excuse me, the chairs of both computer science and philosophy to put forward a proposal for uh, kind of a, a ramp up phase in a steady state phase. So we were successful in hiring for, uh, sorry, we were successful in uh, receiving a, a faculty line for a joint computer science and philosophy position. And we were also successful in hiring into that line. Uh, Professor Stephen Coyne was hired into that line and he's actually joining us uh, uh, here today in the audience. Hi, Steve. Um, and so we are now in the, we've just, we're just kind of wrapping up the first uh, year of our three years ramp up phase. We've managed to uh, expand to seven embedded ethics modules this year, reaching around 1800 students in, in, in this year alone. Um, and so while we started fairly small with one module in <laughs> two years ago, then to four to seven, um, we are trying to ramp up to kind of reach a larger audience in our fairly large, pro uh, fairly large program and department. Um, our steady state goal, which I've mentioned at the bottom of the slide, is for all computer science students to see at least one embedded ethics module per year across their four years of study. And because of the diversity uh, of courses that our students can be taking, we estimate that this will require roughly 12 modules, uh, active modules being delivered every year. So we aren't there yet, but we are sort of, you know, hoping to reach there by the end of our uh, ramp phase. Uh, so on this slide here, uh, I'm showing a uh, table of our current seven undergraduate uh, embedded ethics modules. Um, you can see uh, I've highlighted two modules that might be of particular interest to this group here. Uh, we have a module in the third year introductory machine learning course that, that talks about recommender systems, measuring user preferences, as well as kind of ethical issues related to free speech and manipulation and, and censorship. Uh, we also have a, a module in a senior level image understanding course that focuses on bias in data sets uh, and kind of tying that into ethical questions of discrimination and morality. Um, I, I do like kind of showing the slide though, um, as, you know, even in a group like this that might be, you know, interested in ethics and AI in particular, because I really do believe in our kind of our, our program believes that, you know, ethics in computing and technology uh, is a fairly large, you know, broad area that has lots of different applications and lots of different diverse, um, you know, ethical considerations to consider. And so our goal for the program uh, is not solely focusing on AI, but really trying to hit students uh, across a broad range of courses. And you can hopefully see from this table that we're trying to reach students across all four years of their study, across a broad range of courses, um, from software design to, uh, to algorithms, to data science and data visualization. Um, I, uh, I also wanna emphasize on this slide that uh, we've seen each of our modules really try to, to kind of uh, Bend, but, oh, sorry, to kind of integrate both computer science and philosophy topics. Uh, and this is something that I'll elaborate more uh, in the next slide. So um, I'm gonna spend a few, uh, two or three minutes just talking about the module pedagogy that we have for, uh, for the development of our modules, because I think this might be useful to, or interesting to a lot of you today. So first of all, um, we do try in our modules to feature a pairing of technical and ethical concepts that's uh, engaging and uh, naturally integrates with the course material. We do not want students to feel like these embedded ethics modules are kind of just dropped in for a class um, and that are completely unrelated to what they're otherwise learning. We want them to feel like it, there's a natural extension or a natural kind of you know alternate lens on what they're learning. Um, and so to this end, uh, modules are co-developed and co-delivered between uh, philosophers and course instructors, uh, and we find that this is, you know, a fairly work-intensive approach, but it's the best way of creating modules that are, um, that are authentic, that bring in ethical considerations in a meaningful way, but that are also meaningfully tied to course content and course material. And where possible, uh, the, the, the modules uh, whatever's discussed during the modules in lectures are then also reinforced and integrated in course assessments or projects on a case by case basis. And I'm happy to more elaborate more on that in the context of, say, our image understanding module uh, in the panel discussion. 
So we also try to do a lot of active learning uh, in our modules. So uh, as much as possible, because our students um, are not necessarily that uh, not necessarily that fluent in kind of uh, philosophy or ethics, um, we want to make sure that we're supporting their learning by using learning best practices. We do a lot of active learning mixing mixed in with traditional lectures. Uh, we give, we try as much as possible to give students the opportunities to uh, do some discovery learning, to discover new ideas or discover possible ethical issues or ethical considerations on their own, so that the more that they discover themselves, the more memorable these uh, lessons are after the module ends. And then again, we try to make sure that this learning is reinforced through follow-up assessments. And finally, uh, it's very important to us in designing our modules to make sure that the discussions are safe and not personal and to avoid any kind of uh, appearance of proselytizing from either the course instructors or the E3I team. Uh, and so to this end, we really try to focus on teaching students you know, how to think, kind of ethical tools, an ethical toolkit, and not what to think. Uh, when we do classroom discussions or small group activities, uh, they're usually centered around uh, thorny ethical issues that have choices and trade-offs with no one right particular answer. Um, and uh, we, one particularly effective strategy we've used has been to bring in um, kind of multiple stakeholders to encourage students to take on different perspectives outside of just their own perspective, uh, which uh, we're dealing with a lot of kind of 18 to 20 year olds, uh, often they're kind of wrapped up by, by nature in their own perspectives, and we encourage them to push them to kind of think beyond that. Um, so uh, we've, we collect student feedback uh, after every module, and one of the, uh, I wanted to share a few kind of quick highlights here. Uh, there are some common themes that have emerged from the feedback that we find very gratifying. Uh, one is that uh, these embedded ethics modules are being well received by students as a way of uh, changing their minds or opening their minds to uh, kind of, you know, the impact that they can have on, uh, on society at large. Um, students kind of go from just thinking about the, the software that they're writing or the code that they're writing and trying to get it to work properly uh, to thinking about uh, you know, what impact that software might have uh, either in their own classwork or in the future in internships or after graduation or uh, in research. And uh, you know, the students saying things like how many students can be impacted by the choices we make uh, are, are things that really were gratifying to hear. And then finally, I'll mention uh, very briefly uh, kind of the work on assessment that we've done, and I'm happy to take, uh, I'm happy to discuss this a little bit more uh, later. So I think that uh, the, the kind of the main achievement here is that we've developed this ethics attitudes and self-efficacy scale uh, uh, for measuring the module impact, and this is something that students complete. Uh, it's a seven-point Likert scale with a series of questions, um, or sorry, a series of statements, including things like, I am interested in learning more about uh, ethical issues arising from technology, and I feel empowered to raise ethical issues arising from technology that might come up during my career. Uh, the main findings that we've made so far, and, and this is you know, ongoing work, uh, is that even a single module uh, can result in a modest increase in both student attitudes towards and self, uh, sorry, attitudes and self-efficacy towards ethical issues in computing. Uh, and finally, uh, we also have begun looking at the impact of several modules over time. Uh, and we found that it may be effective to spread a small number of embedded ethics modules across courses so that students experience them periodically throughout their degree. And this was particularly heartening because even though we're a large department, we're a relatively small program within that department. Uh, and because of our limited resources and the fact that we are you know, working very closely with instructors, asking them to give up class time in order to incorporate some of our modules, we wanted to make sure that even with the kind of the modest approach that we're taking, that there could be some longer term impact. Uh, so I think I've gone a little bit over time. I apologize to my panelists here. I'm going to stop here. Um, I've put up my website. Uh, sorry, I put up our program website here. I'm happy to kind of elaborate on any of the things I've quickly talked about uh, during the panel discussion. Um, I'm also looking forward, of course, to hearing what all of our panelists have to say um, and, and shutting up. So I'm going to stop talking there. Uh, but you know, thank you for your attention and the invitation to speak today. Thank you, David. That, that's really helpful, and that, that gives us again another case study of how this can be handled a, 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 in, a, in a pretty extensive way. Actually, there's a high numbers of students, which is which is really, um, I think, encouraging to see. Um, 
wondered, didn't know whether you had any thoughts about that. I mean, um, you know, close connections to 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 some of the things you're involved with. What what are your initial thoughts about that? Yeah, absolutely. I was like nodding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what we're that's what we're aspiring to do, I guess. And we, I suppose, we've done it on a, a smaller level. Um, maybe I, I'll talk a little bit about, about what was happening at TU Dublin and, and what we've tried to, to change. Um, so at TU Dublin, we had uh, one module, and it was called um, Professional Aspects of Computer Science. And it was a kind of a hold all module for everything from professional conduct, legal aspects, ethical aspects. And it was, it was actually a core module, it was a second year module. Um, and it, 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 was, it was sort of very wide and very thin, I think is how you would describe it. And particularly um, with the introduction of GDPR and so on, the legal aspects seemed to run really close and that was at the expense of the, of the you know, the, the kind of aspects. And the other thing that we found with that module was we had very poor engagement with it. It was like it was the only soft module we had in this very sort of technical curriculum. The students were just not uh, engaging with it at all. So I think two things happened that have sort of made things a little bit better. The first thing, I suppose, is um, the ethics for you projects that funded. Uh, and so we started to look at this like, in, in more depth, and we certainly started to look at sort of best practices in literature. Um, and, and you know the, the Harvard example and the uh, embedded ethics example, and you know trying to sort of move away from this idea that ethics should be taught as a standalone module yeah. on its own. There should be a sort of a distributed pedagogy approach, and, and you know the, the evidence and the literature was telling us that infusing, and we were talking about computer science ethics, say on one part of it, but infusing this across the curriculum gives students a kind of a better understanding of the ethical impacts and, and possible harmful consequences. And it sort of reinforces that message that, you know, thinking about ethics is something that you do as a computer scientist. You just don't do it in second year undergraduate and you never <laughs> think about this ever again, because I think that's exactly kind of what was happening. So as part of that, we started uh, part of the ethics we use. Um, Project. And the other thing I suppose was that all, a lot of these issues were, were really interconnected. Like, say we were looking at a topic like privacy, we were like, well, that should be taught in, a, in an AI, a machine learning model, but it should also be, be taught if we're, if we're looking at Internet of Things, and it should also be taught if we're looking at user interface design, right? So all of these things come together. So we're in, in the Ethics Review Project, we're, we're focused on, on a sort of case study approach and a train the trainer module, so developing resources for computer science lecturers. So when we started to think about, well, how would this work? We, well, we said we want to design what we call bricks because they're small pieces of content but that they can be reused or adapted across you know, different types of modules. And um, so and I think the other thing then that really helped us was as part of, a, we had a, uh, recently a university um, module review right from the top. Every module in the university had to be reviewed. Uh, to see what we we're doing in terms of sustainability, which is one of our strategic goals. But we sort of piggybacked on that and said, well, why we're looking at our modules for sustainability in the Department of Computer Science, and we look at what we're doing in terms of ethics. So we did this ethics review um, of, of all our modules. So, you know, it was a, an exercise. We, we sat down with lecturers, we were talking about content, we did this as part of the project. And, you know, significant number of modules bubbled up to the top saying that, for example, we should be teaching ethics uh, in, in these, these modules. And, and we worked very much with, with lecturers on that. And it's part of the piece of computer programming, AI, and so on. So, now in terms of AI ethics, I suppose all of our modules are scripted, have been rewritten so that there is. Sort of an, an ethics uh, component there. It's, it's mostly the topics we're talking about their fairness, accountability, trust, bias, and so on. And we're working with lecturers to achieve this. I think there's still a real inclination for lecturers to say, I have 13 weeks of teaching. Yeah. For the first 12, I'm going to teach the core <laughs> content. And then the last one, I'm going to teach you know, all of the ethics <laughs> of in one module. So we're trying to very much sort of move away from that. Again, this kind of idea of, of embedded ethics, particularly in the machine learning modules that I'm working with lecturers on, we're starting at, say, looking at the methodology. So looking, let's say, at Chris DM. So when you're teaching Chris DM, let's have an ethics check at every step in the methodology. So, you know, when it's your, your, your requirements and your stakeholders, it's you're working with 
users in a particular domain of ethics to be considered in that domain. Think about that. What you're talking about there in terms of data understanding, thinking about you know biases that then doing those kind of checks in, in, in your data. Then moving to the design part of you know you're designing your algorithms. Uh, do they discriminate? Are they you know are, are you excluding users? Going to the model. Do you need to use black box model? You know, do we need to do that? Can we use an explainable model? Does it have to be a you know a generation a neural net or can we do it with something else? And then getting to the evaluation again, what you're talking you're talking about there. Those moves, we of course we have to, to evaluate our model for accuracy, but what about explanation? What about trust? What about transparency? So what are the different units? So it's that bringing it in so that every step. In the machine learning process, they're thinking, oh yeah, there's an explanation there. Okay, yes. And embedding that. So it's I think it's something I think it's what, what I like to think about. I think it's a creating muscle memory for students that they just they have to keep thinking about this as, as, as they're going through. So I suppose to summarize, I think we're better than we were five years ago. Uh, but I still think you know we're learning, yeah. we have a long way to go. I think it's something we'd like to see across all our modules. And the big thing I think for us is it's the change, and I like what you're talking about there, is the change in, in mentality for lecturers as well, like how to deliver it is huge. So in our project, I think it's focused very much on training the trainer. We're a technological university. We don't have a philosophy department. It's very hard to get external people in. We need to train the computer science lecturers how, how to do this. And most computer science lecturers are really uncomfortable doing things like Debates and role play. So you know, how do we train people to to deliver those kind of activities? You know, and, and exactly like you're saying there, um, you know, even for the lecturers to, to understand, well, there's no right answer here. There's, you yeah. know, we can debate this, we can role play it, right? Um, and it's okay to have that sort of debate in this kind of you know safe space for us to think about it. So that's where we are now in terms yeah. of. And in terms of the funding, mm. so it's currently funded for a period of time. Is the idea to try and set things up so that it continue even when the funding is no longer there? Yeah, well, the funding has actually kind of just ended, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah, we have a, a, a sister project that's, that's more really actually based really around exclusion and inclusion, so it's a, right. a, a bit narrower. Right. But actually, it's, it's in our department. Uh, uh, the thing about the Ethics for You project, I think we're very fortunate. Um, is that we have you know six six lecturers in the department working on this, so right. you know we really right. sort of brought that into the teaching, and all of those lecturers teach and, and those modules, hmm. and it's just it's keeping it on the agenda as well. You know, like sort of when we would have a sort of a regular school meeting, we would constantly kind of updating on sort of what's going on in the project. We're looking for volunteers. We have created these materials. Does anyone want to test them in, in yeah. class? It's that kind of constant engagement yeah. as well, a piece of yeah. lecturers as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm keen to um hear whether the experiences are similar from a sort of if you like a sort of um china-based perspective and a sort of africa-based perspective but i think before i do that i might just go to zoe since you're since you're <laughs> here and um just be interested to know how many of the things you've heard so far seem very familiar from a kind of medical ethics perspective i mean are these conversations that um you know you've been involved with yourself Yes, <laughs> and there are some more. So I can okay. perhaps show you some of the yeah. other pitfalls that yes. could happen. So I think the parallel, thank you for inviting me, and I think the parallel's good. And I think it's interesting to hear about different uh, different departments across the world thinking about how this is a problem. And I think it's interesting to think about how can you work out what the core topics are that should perhaps be consistent. So um, I was just going to share with you kind of the national approach as opposed to the Cambridge approach. And um, so, as you said, I, I trained in the 1990s and I wasn't taught medical ethics and I now teach it. I hope I'm good enough to do so, but I wasn't taught it at the time as an undergraduate. And no one really was. Um, people did some interesting, they did it kind of out of interest, perhaps as a part two, perhaps through reading, there were some seminars. And essentially they were a group of um, uh, medics and philosophers, I guess, like you guys, who went, wait a second, we need to be, we need to be dealing with this. And they set up a charity called the Institute of Medical Ethics. They started writing medical ethical articles and eventually started a journal called the Journal of Medical Ethics. And the money from that journal funded the charity, the Institute of Medical Ethics. And the Institute of Medical Ethics was a charity who whose objective was to 
integrate teaching of medical ethics across the UK and then to help internationally. So it was like very explicit, we need to outline what this is. If I fast forward a few years, because you don't need to know the whole story, um, about 10, maybe 15 years ago now, there was a survey of what medical ethics teaching was actually happening in all the universities across the UK. And it was very piecemeal, um, but they were able to show that there was a problem, that there was this inconsistency. Everyone got taught anatomy, but not everyone got taught medical ethics. And actually, we all, you'll be happy to know doctors do really need to think about medical ethics. <laughs> um, <clears throat> And that's me actually not so much once you're finished, unless you're a surgeon, you're probably tired of it. <laughs> if you're a surgeon, you need to know that anyway. Um, so, so there was a kind of an assessment of what was being taught, and then there was a consensus building exercise, which sounds really dull, but actually it was quite interesting in lots of regards. So representatives from all the medical schools, other external people were coming in saying what actually should the core content in medical ethics and law be. And unbelievably, that was agreed upon. So the Institute of Medical Ethics led what the full content for medical ethics and law should be. And I guess things like um, listening to what David's forces are very interesting in being able to gain the experience of what, what had come from Mira, sorry, what would have come from all these different forces, what did the students really value, um, and not only what should the content be, but then I only also talked about how should it be delivered? And crucially, and this is a pitfall, how should it be assessed? Um, so if you don't assess the teaching of medical ethics, then I'm afraid medical students are just gonna learn the anatomy of the foot um, because they're tested on that. So you have to work out how you're going to assess it. Um, and again, make that bit consistent, work out how you're gonna share resource in teaching and in assessing. Um, and then I think, and again, this is a parallel workout, how you bring in philosophers and lawyers and people with expertise. Um, I loved what you said about muscle memory. So I think one of the things about medical ethics is, is thinking when you get a new problem, okay, what are the tools I have to approach this problem? It's not, ah, oh, I've seen this question about confidentiality before and I know how to answer this way. It's, huh, I have a new challenge of a woman who wants to deliver a baby and such and such, I can't, and then making one up at this but, and I need to think about what are the different components that I need to consider, what are the thinking that I need to do, who do I need to speak to, how do I make sure that I deal with this equ equitably, transparently, and you know, what are the principles I need to be thinking about, what are I talk about at the ethical toolbox. So I think it's that question of teaching not only the specific case scenarios, but teaching a basic fundamental, yeah. what, what is in my toolbox, what's yeah. my ethics toolbox. Yeah. Um, and for me, that means teaching it not, as you say, in a week at the end of the module, but integrating it all the way through and actually examining it probably in the other parts of the course. So the ethics isn't just an ethics module that you test for, that there are ethical assessments in the other bits of the components yeah. of what you're testing. So they can't just bin it. <laughs> so that would be my start of the 10. Yeah. No, that's interesting. As you say, it has to be set up in a way that it can't just be jettisoned by the students yeah. strategically. Yeah. You know, they can't because, avoid it. <laughs> because the ones, the ones that are interested in it are probably already quite good at it. Yeah. What you true. need to do is make sure everyone gets it. That's true. That's true. I wonder whether our other um, panelists, so um, Letitia, this is where it becomes a seance. Are you there? Can you hear us? <laughs> if so, could you put your camera on if you're willing to uh, do that? Afternoon. Like, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, sorry. I thought we were one hour ahead of you. <laughs> That's okay. Don't worry. Don't worry. I'm in now. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. Ha have you been able to hear some of what's been said so far? Yes, I joined, uh, in the, well, not quite long ago. I joined about two, 20 minutes ago. Okay. Okay, good, good. I just wondered whether you'd like to say something about all of this from your perspective and the way that the teaching of AI ethics is currently handled from either a sort of Nigerian perspective or, or perhaps more broadly a sort of African perspective. Okay, thank you. Well, in Nigeria, AI ethics is not being taught in our universities for now. What we actually have is just AI. So we are looking at how we can integrate ethics into AI because ethics is very important when it comes to AI. We can't just be developing, we have a lot of people developing AI, AI systems, AI models without considering ethics. So right now, the National um, Information Techno Technology Development Agency, NIDA, which is actually in charge of 
information, anything that has to do with IT. Mm -hmm. They have actually constructed a committee that will develop the first AI policy. So the AI policy will guide AI developers in developing AI systems. So I happen to be one of the committee that is also looking into that, um, into the AI, developing the first AI policy. So for now, most of the studies, or most of the things we are doing in Nigeria, most of the courses we are doing that has to do with AI does not have AI ethics. But fortunately for us, there's a, the, the, the NUC, which is the National University Commission, there's also a stakeholder in charge of education, coordinating education activities in Nigeria. They came up with what to call the core curriculum minimum academic standard. So in that core curriculum minimum academic standard, they were able to develop 70% of that core curriculum for all universities in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. So we're supposed to actually follow that guideline that has been developed, which of course, the stakeholders also in, include the, the academia. So it's not just the NUC that came up with that uh, CCMAS, what you call CCMAS. So they have given a room for us to include 30% of any course that is not included in that curriculum. So right now, what myself and my team are doing in my own university, University of Port Harcourt, we are looking at how we can develop a course called AI Ethics so that it can be integrated into the computer science course because computer science is a program of, on its own. So we want to include AI ethics as a course. We have AI already that's already existing in the course curriculum, but we want to include AI ethics so that ethics can be, can be, um, can be, can be practiced when people are developing and deploying these AI models. Mm -hmm. So that is where we are for now. It is being, we are, they are, they are still processing it. Then when it comes to Ghana, I know that uh, the Kwame University uh, has, has actually developed uh, an AI ethics uh, framework, which they call the facets. So they have been able to develop that. So what it means is that Africa is being aware that there's need for us to integrate ethics into AI. So Ghana has done something and South Africa has also, I know they have also, they're also teaching AI ethics. So it's also included in their curriculum. I also know that Kenya has also integrated ethics into their AI curriculum. So for Nigeria, Nigeria is, 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 is getting there because we already, we have already, we have also, also submitted the, our, frame, our draft, the draft that had to do with the NEDA AI policy. That's the, the, um, the committee that was set up to develop that AI policy guideline that will guide AI system developers in developing whatever system they want to develop. Because it is not enough for us to develop these AI systems and deploy them to the, to the cloud for people to start making use of it without considering the users. The users must be considered, especially when it comes to agriculture, when it comes to health sector, when it comes to uh, the, the, the finance, even labor productivity. So these are the things that we considered while developing this AI policy, although it's still being, it's still, we are still, it's still in the process of being, it's not, of being used. It has not been um, officially been deployed for people to start making use of it. Mm -hmm. So that is uh, what we are in right now. Nigeria universities, we are not teaching AI ethics as a course in any of our higher institutions. But we believe that with time, Africa will get there because they are, they are, Africa is now, it's now, it's now aware the need to integrate ethics into our AI curriculum. Right. Thank you. And are you in um, regular contact with your colleagues in places like Kenya or South Africa? Um, you know, do you share materials in your thinking about this, or is there a sense that that it's handled quite differently in different places? Yes, for, for, as, for example, I'm working with. Um, they call my colleague at uh, Kenya, that's the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. We are working together. They that have already started using it, but we have not started. I'm working with them. We're looking at the courses they, 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 you know, they, they, are, they are teaching under this AI uh, ethics. So I'm working with them. I'm, and I'm also a member of the RAIN, uh, RAIN Africa, that's the Responsible Artificial Intelligence Network in Nigeria. I'm the representative. 
So we are looking at how we can develop these uh, AI systems. They also have a colleague in Uganda. They have not actually integrated ethics into their AI, 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 uh, AI curriculum. So there is, they are also looking at it, how they can integrate ethics into AI, because it's very important that ethics must be integrated into AI. They also have a colleague in South Africa, okay? In their own case, they've actually started. They have already, they have already started implementing it. So they are teaching AI ethics. And uh, they, those in, in philosophy are actually part of the system, not just those in, in computer science alone. Those in philosophy actually uh, in, in collaborate with them. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's something that uh, both computer science, those in philosophy, those in engineering. So they teach this talk, they, they course in South Africa. Okay, so, but in Nigeria, just like I said before, we have not actually started teaching AI ethics as a course, but we hope yeah. to start because the AUC has actually given us the room for us to include ethics in our AI curriculum. So yeah. that is where we are for now. We're still working on that. So I cannot talk about the courses that uh, we are supposed to teach in AI ethics um, curriculum. Yeah, no, thank you. That, that, that's really helpful. And I think as expected, this is bound to be one of the recurring themes about computer scientists, philosophers, engineers, <laughs> how is all this coordinated? And, and of course, different universities have different types of faculty and departmental structures and, and it's not always straightforward, but, but I mean, that's inevitably gonna be one of the difficulties around this. Um, just wondered if we've got, have we got Yi Cheng, are you there? Are you able to put your camera on and join us? Brilliant, good to see you. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, I hope you've been able to hear some of the things that have been said so far. And again, I just wondered if from, your perspective, if you had any thoughts about anything, anything that hasn't been mentioned, perhaps, that you think is particularly important. Right. Uh, thank you. I think uh, it was very interesting to, uh, uh, to, to get the progress on the embedded ethics uh, approach. Maybe uh, I can, what I can add is another angle, uh, how to, you know, to, to, to have AI ethics have its own school of thoughts as a general framework. Uh, and then to you know, to, to complement what we have on the embedded ethics approach. So basically, I, I teach uh, uh, philosophy and ethics of AI uh, starting five years ago uh, at University of Chinese Academy of Sciences as a starting point. And now it's been the sixth version uh, at, at this university. And now it's also the first version in uh, Tsinghua University where they have the Schwarzman Scholar, um, where I teach the, the course on ethics and governance of AI. Uh, so I'm going to compare uh, some of the efforts uh, in these two places, uh, hopefully to complement what we've been achieved uh, for, for, for today. Uh, so in, in the University of Chinese Academy of Sciences trying, it starts very much uh, like uh, what everybody was talking about in, in, in the, the school, the technical school itself. I think it, it was very interesting uh, five years ago when I started the course as a summer course. And then my department said that, well, maybe you're not so qualified to teach ethics of AI because you're not trained uh, as a PhD in ethics. And I was like, well, because I'm a technical researcher myself in brain-inspired AI, where I focus on brain-inspired spiking neural networks. Well, well, to me, I was like, okay, so someone who was trained in ethics, they're not trained in technical AI. So no one was really actually qualified, you know, uh, to, uh, as chair professor for this course in this case. Uh, oh, but I think uh, what well, to me it, it was very grateful that uh, several years ago uh, I, I started my you know interactions um, with, with Cambridge to be an associate fellow at the uh, Leverhulme Center for the Future of Intelligence, uh, and also the, I was very grateful that um, the, the Oxford Institute for Ethics of AI they invited me as an advisory board member, and and then then people at the university was oh okay then you're somewhat qualified. And then, and then to 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 kickstart the um, the 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 trying. Uh, what I want to add in here is that if we put the course ethics of AI or governance of AI in the context of uh, uh, philosophy from a computing perspective, um, 
then you need to rethink and reboot, you know, the roots of AI and where are we headed for the right direction? And what we uh, and for that direction, um, for different approaches, you know, towards the future AI, they have different associated risks, very different. Um, uh, well, uh, the technology, if you choose different um, approaches, you will face different futures. But if you have a philosophical, you know, consideration as a starting point, and then you get, you know, the the, the different challenges and why they're in this pass. But if you, you know, just you know, forget about you know different the the roots of different approaches to 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 AI, and then you will just get confused because the risks are kind of messed up. Uh, some of the risks are, you know, for uh, deep neural nets, while the others are for, you know, spiking neural networks, and then, and, and to some extent, for for the others, they are for, you know, uh, they're for, you know, rule-based systems. Uh, they're they're quite different, um, but you will not, but you will not meet all of them in the same pass. So you, so so you you have to, for us, we you, you have to start, uh, you know. The discussion on philosophy of AI, and then to show from a technical point of view and show the different paths and the different futures, which which uh, which direction actually leads to AI as a general tool, well, which direction leads to AI as a potential you know quasi member of the society, or you know a a, a partner of the society. It was very interesting. Uh, that in, in in Asia, as a complementary view for Western uh, philosophy, uh, especially I think in Japan, that people see uh, AI as a quasi member of the society uh, instead of AI as a tool. Uh, so, um, so in, in, at the University of Chinese Academy of Sciences, trying it was very easy for you know Asian students uh, to uh, to accept the the idea. Of AI as a quasi member, um, but uh, in my Schwarzman scholar trying, it was very hard because people there they mostly they they they're from the United States and Europe, Stanford, Yale, and, and so they just say that okay, so so AI is just a tool and they cannot be you know a, another living uh, becoming. Um, they they cannot be you know partners. So they might be competitors. Uh, just like what the sci-fi showed us, but it's hard to be a to be a partner. So, so they're they're quite negative uh, about the idea. Uh, so I think, but, but I think this comparative study actually shows the importance of uh, inclusivity uh, from a cultural point of view. Uh, that uh, as a master or bachelor student, you have to be inclusive enough. You know, to see different cultures, different histories, why people accept the different ideas, why people accept the technology and its role in different perspectives into the society. So I think that for, for that it was uh, super, uh, it was super interesting. Uh, and when when I was talking about the idea, uh, when I was a uh, you know year two bachelor student, uh, uh, to, to watching the movie from Steven Spielberg about artificial intelligence. So I was um, I was uh, super excited about the idea, you know, uh, of creating a robot that can love. And uh, well, well, the the ultimate uh, philosophical question is that what if that you know a robot can love a human being? Well, uh, on the other side, what is the duty towards human uh, as a return that well, what is the duty for human to hold that has to hold for a robot that can love uh, human beings uh, and to the Chinese student and students from Pakistan they were like uh, fascinating it it was it was uh, the bright future that if a human can be responsible for a quasi member of the society it was a symbiotic society and for and for the tryings at Schwarzman, people were like, uh, "Are you really positive about you know people uh, about human to accept this stupid idea?" And so I think the the contradictions shows the differences in, like I said, in history, in different people's uh, perspectives. 
Uh, this, this is something that we have learned, uh, which is very uh, interesting. And I think uh, the approach of embedded ethics uh, is very important. Well, my complementary view is that uh, if you have this kind of, you know, a, 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 you know, a, a synthetic um, um, program designed for philosophy and ethics of AI with different students from different schools when they attend, well, for me, my, my trend was like 80% of the students were from technical school. So 20% of them are from humanities. So people from different uh, uh, departments they always fight with each other in the course. Uh, that was super interesting that when people from school of humanities, uh, from technical universities, uh, technical departments, they were like, what you guys know about technology? So you, you, you just, it's a, just a waste of time to talk about, you know, the potential risks right there, uh, given that there are a lot more opportunities to try. And for the humanities students, they, they were like, what do you know about social service and the human society in the, fu in the future? So um, they, they fight with each other, but they have to be rational to some extent uh, for, you know, a, a, a discussion for complementary ideas and how to understand each other from different uh, angles at last. So I think that's uh, that's also uh, very interesting. I'm, I'm going to share uh, finally um, maybe the uh, maybe the examples uh, that that also shows you know deeply rooted into technology while on the other uh, side uh, it, it shows the cultural differences. Something like when we were you know having a discussion on the large language models re recently and people were like oh why some of the trines uh, from china it says oh, oh okay so these language models has to obey uh, the chinese law why that because it's a you know an open model that everyone can use why it has to obey chinese law and and, and then so it's a it's a challenge from my Stanford student at Schwarzman. Uh, and then, and then we'll, we do a detailed investigation and the creator of these Chinese large language model, they were like, oh, okay. So OpenAI argue that you have to obey the US law. Why not? We cannot say we obey the Chinese law. And then my student were like, oh, we never know that the OpenAI trying has to obey the US law in this case, let's go for restrictive licensing for AI models. That could be a very interesting, um, you know, ethical discussions. W was that necessary, you know, for open source uh, software? So I think the, uh, the I, I think uh, the debates and discussions finally leads to some interesting idea uh, to the frontier that, that, that we have to solve. Uh, for, for this field. And for the sharing question that you've been talking about, uh, in this course, we, we provide a uh, AI governance observatory online uh, platform uh, for you know, different students you know, to synthesize uh, different cases that they saw, and then to make some tags uh, for different cases. So one of the cases could be associated to different attacks uh, related to different topics of ethics of AI. Uh, and, and by that, well, people reach out, uh, reach to consensus to understand uh, a specific uh, cases, where on the other side, people also disagree with each other uh, to some extent. So I'll, I'll, share the, I'll share the AI observatory, AI governance observatory, uh, in the dialogue uh, box uh, later. So to summarize, I, I would say that uh, for students, if they have multi, uh, if they have different, if they are affiliated to different uh, departments, uh, it's great that they will investigate up about this idea from different perspectives. We're on the other side. If they are from different cultures, super, you just give them the opportunity to show why their culture or their value are important to, to, to as a complementary approach to the rest of the world. 
And then you, when you try to understand from their culture, you will see different possibilities of AI, the way it can be uh, embedded into, into the, 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 the society. And then you get a chance to learn each other, not only about the opportunities, but also about the, the risk right there. I'll stop here for now. No, thank you. And, and I think, I mean, it goes without saying that the, the point about the cultural context here is crucial. I mean, I think it's not an oversimplification to say that, you know, if you've got a neural network in the UK or in Ireland or in Canada or in China or in Nigeria, it's kind of the same thing. And there's probably some agreement about what it is and how it works, but um, the same is not true necessarily of a particular ethical perspective. I mean, that things may be viewed very differently depending upon the country and the culture in which the work's being done. And so that that's where I guess the most sort of variation is across these things. Um, I just wondered whether any of the panelists had anything to say in response to anything that they've heard so far. I think small enough in number that you could just put your sort of physical hand up either in Zoom or in, in person and, and I should be able to notice because I'm keen for you to sort of, um, you know, get anything clarified if it's not, if it's not clear from the discussion. Um, I mean, I think one of the issues that... Um, uh, go, go ahead, David. Go ahead. Thank you. I was going to say... Uh, uh, and I'll, I'll try to be brief here because I've taken up a lot of time already, but I I loved uh, what was said earlier about, I guess, two things in particular. One was um, what you just said about kind of bringing in global perspectives. Uh, and, you know, I mean, this is true for kind of a lot of our panelists here, but I'm thinking about in the context of the embedded ethics modules, uh, you know, at the University of Toronto, I've talked about how we use multiple stakeholders, um, but I'm kind of reflecting on the fact that even in that context, we've been mainly using multiple stakeholders within a Toronto or North American context. And I'm sort of humbled by thinking, yeah, what would, be, what would our modules look like and how would they be enriched by bringing in, you know, stakeholders from more international contexts for, for us? So so I think that's uh, that's something that I'm I'm really getting out of this. The other thing I wanted to mention uh, in in kind of talking about assessments, which is you know a, a really big question, um, we uh, I, I didn't talk about this so much. We had mainly focused in our program on delivering modules, and I think this was uh, uh, sort of seen as like a uh, kind of the, the lowest hanging fruit, like making sure that the instructors were comfortable creating materials that we could then deliver to students or co-deliver with students in their classes. Um, and where possible, we've been looking for opportunities to uh, incorporate what we're doing in the classes into course assignments. Sometimes they've been uh, sometimes they've been more standalone reflections, and sometimes they've been integrated with existing more technical assignments. And while the latter is preferable, we've also uh, you know every instructor we've worked with has been its own uh, kind of working relationship that we negotiate. Uh, you know how much class time the instructor is willing to kind of work with us for, how much on the assessment side the instructor is willing to work with us for. And I think how we're viewing the, the program as a whole is to try to use um, the module time as a stepping stone to build in larger assessments. Um, I love what uh, was said about train the trainers because one of the things that we're discovering as we work with different instructors is that um, a lot of them are interested in ethics or ethical issues, whether it's you know AI or, or broadly for computing, but aren't necessarily don't ha necessarily have a lot of confidence um, either in kind of the delivering the content purely on their own or delivering assessments, things like role play, debates, grading essays, <laughs> uh, for example. So these are things that um, we've we've started with kind of the module delivery aspect, but we are hoping to grow this into kind of more uh, integrated assessments as well. And that's gonna be an ongoing project that I, I wanted to say, I, I very much am on board with and we're, we're uh, kind of working on it here. I'm sure others are as well. Thank you. No, I think you're quite right. I mean, the, the issue of um, assessing the work of the students who are, who are maybe um, taking some of these modules, I mean, you know, again, from a sort of traditional, I guess, computer science sort of AI perspective, I mean, the temptation is always to, to, you know, get them to build some kind of system to compare it to a baseline, if they get better scores, whether it's a word error rate or a blue score or some other metric, then it's a better system. And so they've done well, you know, but in, in these contexts, that's maybe overly simplistic. And there should probably be other other forms of assessment that are worked into that. I mean, in, in, in strictly metric terms, it may be a worse system, mm -hmm. but there may be ethical reasons why it's a preferable system. Um, again, I don't know whether from a sort of medical ethics perspective, uh, how does the assessment work? I mean, okay, different field, but yeah, no, not, no, no. not so far removed. It's relevant though, I think, because I don't think you can adequately assess ethics within 
with the multiple choice question. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, setting an ethics exam um, separate isn't, I don't think, the way to do it, really. Um, so I think either you can have a piece of coursework which is assessed, which is what we do for, for our first years. So we teach them the basic things and then we ask them to go and look at something they're interested in and grapple like, and, and explain what the ethical analysis is of that. Mm -hmm. So we basically want them to demonstrate something new that they can they can apply the basic ethics toolbox that I was talking about yeah. to a medical problem. And you can imagine how you could do that with, I clearly don't know any um, AI code, but you could imagine how you could yeah. have as part of whatever coursework they had to do their coding or they had to come up with something and then they had to say, okay, what are the ethical issues with this and how have they addressed them? And there yeah. might be some way of assessing that. Yeah. Um, but again, I think it's about integrating it into the other things you're assessing rather than saying here's a standard. Yeah. yeah, I think that's right. And again, it's been a theme so far this afternoon, the need to fully integrate so that it's not just I do the, the kind of normal you know, medical sciences stuff and then there's this ethics thing yeah. that I do separately. It's, it's exactly. got to be properly... I think properly the other thing I realised I didn't say, sorry, which I just wanted to while I had the floor, was say, while I teach the first year, so we keep on teaching it all the way through the six years. So, and we work together as an ethics group. So it is, again, it's another example of it not being yep. like a standalone thing. Yep. At each point it, it gets taught. And the training the trainers thing is really interesting because the, I told you, I wasn't taught medical ethics. So I can tell you for sure the consultants that are older than me aren't taught medical <laughs> ethics. And the medical students, uh, actually one of the questions that comes up most commonly is, how do I challenge someone who hasn't considered mm. X or Y? Mm. And I think that's something that you guys will see as well. Mm. As your juniors get trained, yeah. they then, I think one of the things you need to be teaching them is because they're trained, they actually have a responsibility to help their seniors as well, mm. which is a real citizen responsibility. Mm. Yeah, and I think there's generational elements or is a factor here. And again, um, you know, certainly around these areas, some of the people who are in positions of, of let's say, authority within a university structure went through <laughs> before any kind of ethical considerations were, were central. Um, and therefore, there's sometimes the attitude, well, I didn't need any of this stuff and I've built some of the best systems in the world. So clearly it's not necessary, <laughs> which is <laughs> something that needs to be counted. Right. <laughs> yeah, I'm shocked. <laughs> so, I'm just, that's okay to come in. I mean, I think exactly what you said there, about the two of it. That is so key. I mean, that I think is, is almost why we're teaching ethics, right? Is that to give people the toolkit, not just the toolkit, it's actually been there, the language, the vocabulary, to when they come across an ethics issue, to be able to actually raise it and to raise it in a way that, first of all, they, they, they thought about it before, but it's the language. So it doesn't sound like really subjective. Oh, I think this is mm. something, you know, <laughs> that it's actually grounded in something, it's grounded in some value. So that when they do go into industry and maybe they're asked to create a piece of code or do something or whatever it is, that they have the language to actually express yeah. that. I think that's a key part of, of why we're teaching ethics. I think that and building empathy with you with any that's huge as well. Yeah. You know, we have to think about that. But that toolkit, that language, that vocabulary is really yeah. important. So yeah. really and maybe that's part of how you challenge the yeah. you know, those higher up the yeah. higher up yeah. the command line as well. I think we've got some questions coming in <laughs> from various yeah. people. Again, people online, and I'm sure there's there are questions in the room. Do you want to go to any of the ones online? I don't know how you're going to rank all of them. Yeah, I'm happy I mean, to be guided by you. One of them, I hope everyone can hear me online as well. Um, one of them is actually related to the topic, um, and Johnny Penn asked this question. Okay. Um, in relation to medical ethics, um, he said that there are some significant disanalogies between the two areas, such as need for credentials, membership, and self-regulation, self-regulating professional body, role of monopoly powers, um, and so on. Um, the analogy feels a bit disingenuous. In disingenuous. Disingenuous. <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> and out of sync with contemporary realities, are there instances of computer science-led efforts toward accountability that you that to you say otherwise sorry <laughs> um okay so i think it's fair to say where the analogy falls down you know there are definitely we are a professional group who is the question who is that uh is there someone that, no, 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 no no so we you know we, we are regulated and not only that but we can be sanctioned for acting unethically 
So, but I think that that goes another step, which is actually, well, should we put that on its head? And should there be a way of sanctioning people who write code that is not ethical or who, so I think it's not that medics should be unregulated. I think it's that perhaps we should be thinking about people who are providing such a critical central tool to what the rest of us do should be. And actually, um, this question, I, I was it you that said, you know, maybe we don't need to be using the black box. Mm -hmm. Someone said at some point, mm -hmm. I can't remember someone moves. Anyway, someone said mm -hmm. we need to be thinking about what we're doing and whether something's explainable. So, um, and there's this whole question in terms of trust in AI about how much you can trust if you don't know what goes on in the mm -hmm. black box and how much you know. and and my argument would be we have to be able to trust the people who are building it. Yeah. So how can you prove that you're trusting the people that are building it? Yeah. Well, you need to have some kind of training and you need to have some kind of sanction if they do something yeah. nefarious. And if they haven't, you know, you need to set some standards about bias. So I see your challenge and I'm afraid I think that you need to be more regulated. Than yeah. so, so at the moment, <laughs> the analogy isn't a particularly great one, but it should become a better yeah. analogy. <laughs> yeah. That would be my, okay. that would be my okay. response. <laughs> okay. And I thought that Johnny agreed. So I think something you like. Know, that should be accountable. You know, you've got it's a very complex supply chain. You've got the data providers, you've got the data enablers, you've got the technology yeah. providers, you've got the model developers. You know, so there's accountability and all of that. Yeah. You know, so yeah. Okay, I see that you got your your hand up, Yi. Do you want to come in at this point? Uh, yeah, I think maybe I can go for another. Uh, Topic that uh, Johnny Pan uh, raised about the the big tax mass layoff on ethics AI ethics workers and how do we see it uh, uh, from the efforts of uh, AI educators uh, and towards the you know the differences uh, of the industrial um, requirement. I, I I don't see this as inconsistency. I think uh, this is a temporary trying from the industry that they are looking for short term you know benefits ignoring the long term uh, 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 risk right there but it it is exactly the value of uh, uh, teaching ai ethics uh, that talk about you know the long term goals for a more sustainable and stable development of ai so for these graduators as masters and phd candidates that has been trained within the course or as a you know, as a as a degree that they, that they have the qualification, uh, you know, to 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 lead the future, and very possibly to 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 talk to those important guys in, in the industry and, and and make a change. So we have to push forward the 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 idea and and make the you know the next generation ready in their mind. Maybe later they won't be a you know ethics uh, uh, officer, but maybe they will be a technical leader with an equipped mind. Uh, by that, and then it's already, you know, a very uh, uh, important uh, trying. And as, and as professors in the university, we have to keep raising the, uh, the, the, the awareness that they, they, that they have to have this. So in China, the practice is something like this. So we have great so we have grad, uh, um, we have master, uh, master students who has just been graduated with uh, with this you know course, and then we would like to recommend them into the industry not only as a you know ethics officer but really to talk to those industry just to you know put these uh, to put these um, ethicists into the technical team. To work together with the technical team, uh, and then to find the contradictions and the problems. One would, one of the example uh, would be that well, the the AI ethicist, the, the my graduators, it, it, she said that, well, you you have to have data erasure for 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 everyone, and then to, talking to the the, the AI geeks, and, and then the developer said that oh it's not possible to erase the data from ai models it is very possible to do it in the database uh, it's not possible for ai models and then and then she said that well the policy said we should do this and the users said that we need them well the technologies said that this is technically not possible for now 
And then you find these contradictions, and then you know what is the future to move on. I mm. think uh, by by that uh, deeply for these uh, uh, ethicist equipped mind or ethicists th themselves, they when they are you know th synthesized together with the ethics in a very close way, uh, you, we get a chance to 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 move on, no matter whether they have a ethicist officer office or team, uh, we have our own way to, to push forward. Yeah. Thank you. Um, any questions in the room? I know we've got one on the screen, but I'm keen you guys are here as well. So I don't I think that was the first hand I saw. Hi, uh, thanks to everyone uh, who's presented <laughs> and who's talking. My name is Maya Ganeshan. Um, I actually co-lead an MST and AI Ethics and Society at the university, uh, but for working professionals, not at the undergraduate or graduate level. Um, so my question is about why there is a preponderance of philosophy in the teaching of ethics when many of the concerns that we're seeing up, you know, with the emergence of AI, if AI is a social, cultural, economic, and political technology, uh, what is the role or place of people from other disciplinary backgrounds? What does philosophy offer and what does it not? Mm -hmm. um, and how do other disciplinary perspectives um, come into this work in your teaching? Yeah, yeah. good question. Anybody want to answer it? <laughs> I think it's a little bit about the language, actually. Yeah. I think it's about the language. So I think um, I work quite closely with philosophers. You could argue they know nothing about medicine, um, but they are able to, so I think you have to work together. So I don't think you can have philosophers coming in and teaching, but I think it's really important to develop collaborations because uh, philosophers have thought for thousands of years on how to define what is good, how to test what is good, how to consider effects and counter effects, examples and counter examples. And, um, and actually, as you said, being able to use that language then also helps challenge people. Instead of just saying, well, that doesn't feel right, you can say, well, okay, I can understand how you've come by that way if you're taking a libertarian view and you think that everybody should have the choice to do whatever, but on the other hand, um, you talk about it from this perspective and so on. So it's a kind of, it's a, it's a, it's a structure to be able to discuss it, but it doesn't work on its own. You can't just have philosophers teaching medics, I don't think, um, or, or IT or AI technicians. Te I don't technicians, that's not right. <laughs> <laughs> Technologists, See, I guess. You just have the right language. <laughs> just all <laughs> Should we alternate one online and then one in the room? Have you got? Yes, I think. Okay, yeah. Joe, do you want to go ahead? You've had your hand up. You might want to. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, I'm from the University of Wisconsin, where I taught computers and society in the 1980s. So we've been uh, on this quite a bit. Uh, I'm wondering about the exit voice and loyalty approach of Albert O. Hirschman, and as well, the uh, whistleblowing approaches there. There are rich literatures in both areas that to do something with their ethical judgments, make uh, decisions about where to go. I'm wondering if any of the panelists integrate those approaches into their, their toolkit. Also, um, the, the uh, role of professional organizations, such as the ACM, Association for Computing Machinery, Machinery probably stronger in the US and the U UK. Uh, how do you, or do you, uh, teach your students how to work with those professional organizations, understand their codes of ethics and all of that. And again, I'm dealing with the practical idea that the student might have some disagreement, some notion of, of uh, uh, inequity that he or she wants to deal with and what to do at that point. So thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you. Anyone want to take that? Um, I, I can say briefly, uh, th thank you, uh, thank you, Joanne, for, for that question. That's great. Um, I would say that, you know, right now, uh, the, the focus that we've had on the on kind of preparing for students for the workplace has been on kind of like how students raise ethical issues kind of in the workplace. But to be honest, we, I don't think we've adopted kind of a formal structure or a formal kind of like set of techniques for doing so. It's been a bit ad hoc based on individual, um, based on kind of the individual collaborations we've had with courses. So um, I've kind of noted what you've kind of just suggested as, as kind of things that I should look into more as ways of kind of guiding the overall structure of the program. I will say that, um, I will say that, uh, so you, sorry, you had kind of two parts of your question. So for the first part kind of, 
helping students become professionals, there's a lot of professional development work uh, in our department and in our industry for preparing students for internships or preparing students for joining the workforce broadly. But one of the things that is kind of missing from those pieces that we're hoping to kind of work on in the future is helping students navigate specifically uh, uh, raising ethical concerns. This is something that they're kind of doing in the context of these modules in the classes and sometimes in follow-up exercises, but we're, we're hoping to kind of go beyond that. Um, and, and to the point about, you know, what are the best structures to do that, they might have kind of like, uh, you know, some baseline language and a small toolkit right now. But of course, putting that into practice in an actual professional setting is, is another story. Uh, one of the things that we're hoping to do in the future is um, actually, uh, because we have a lot of students doing internships, actually doing interviews with the students afterwards who have done modules and asking follow-up questions like, did you encounter any ethical issues on your internship that summer? Did anything that you had seen in a module help with that or did that not help? And kind of using that to kind of iterate on the modules to kind of help prepare students. Um, I'll just quickly mention, we have looked at the ACM, uh, like we have, uh, uh, so, uh, we have looked at kind of the ACM professional guidelines and ethical guidelines, and we do reference those in some of our modules, but currently they are just kind of as a reference. And this is something that I think ties to uh, uh, Johnny, one of Johnny's earlier questions that um, our students don't necessarily care about professional or like, you know, care about uh, computing professional organizations. They don't need to be formally mem uh, formal members or kind of be certified in order to, uh, you know, go into industry or, or into academia. And so right now we're, uh, we are referencing some of these guidelines, but I don't know that they necessarily carry a lot of, a lot of weights, although that's something that, you know, could be improved in the future. So thank you for that question. And I hope I gave an okay answer. Thank you, David. I can come in on that part as well. I think, David, I think when we, before we changed how we teach ethics, how we used to teach ethics was via these, the, the ACM and the IEEE kind of guidelines. And I agree with you. I don't think it was particularly effective. They were sort of just a list of things that, that students would, would read through. We still, we still talk about them, we still reference them, but we do it much more in, in the context of like a case study yeah. or something. So we have this case study over here, take the guidelines, apply that to it. It gives us something to hang it off. Yeah. You know, it just becomes less abstract and it gives students some, something to, to talk about and to reason about and reason through. So I, I think we have pretty much the same pro pro process. We, we sort of reference them, we use them, but mostly in conjunction with other materials that I think students find more compelling, yeah. to be honest. Yeah. I don't know if the question's still there, but there was a question yeah, here. Anyway. Okay. Uh, actually, uh, perhaps I put two different hats on. I, I can make two contributions. Uh, with the hat that I was uh, recently the head of teaching for computer science in Cambridge, uh, I can answer Joanne's question uh, to say that, uh, yes, we do use the ACM curriculum as our primary point of reference uh, for our overall curriculum in computer science here. But I can also tell you in regard to national certification, that during my period as head of teaching, we decided to uh, disaffiliate from the British Computer Society because their certification requirements were too onerous and we found them relevant to professional practice. Uh, we consulted our students, and we found that no student was interested in professional certification from the National Computer Society. So I do know what their policy is on the teaching of ethics, but it's not of particular interest to us, so we think we have more useful things to say. So, oh, and, and also I think that's very relevant to uh, 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 to Letitia's uh, uh, mention of Africa, because I am involved in the development of curriculum in Africa, um, and I think that the, the national uh, centralised control of computer science curriculum in various African countries is actually an obstacle to improving ethical teaching in local universities. I've certainly seen that in Ethiopia. Um, I'm aware of uh, KMUST and in Ghana, uh, and I think that maybe a third degree freedom is helpful there. <laughs> However, uh, that's with one hat on. Uh, the other hat is that I was the convener of the working group that defined the research ethics policy for the School of Technology in Cambridge. Uh, so that includes a number of departments represented here today. Um, the outcome of that uh, was interesting in that we were able to create a, a, a light touch IRB process, uh, specially designed for use by technology students. The consequence of that has been that, um, that our capstone projects in computer science, where they involve research with human participants, which is actually a very surprisingly large number, uh, maybe 30%, I would say, of our undergraduate capstone projects involve research with human participants. 
Uh, every one of those undergraduate students undergoes uh, an IRB review um, of their individual project. Um, and I would say that's really an example of practice-based um, engagement with, with ethics. But it's quite interesting that we do that in the context of research ethics rather than professional ethics. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and I think yeah. that has got two interesting implications in this discussion. One is the fact that at a research-led university like this one, many of our students actually go on to become professional researchers, not to become like software engineers or deployers of commercial IT systems. So that's not something I've heard discussed yet today, is um, especially preparing those students heading for research careers. Um, and I guess the secondary thing is the extent to which a lot of professional practice in computing um, as it applies to social and human questions is conceived of by the companies as a research problem, not an engineering problem. Um, and so from that perspective, I would suggest that maybe teaching research ethics would be better than teaching professional engineering ethics. Uh, that's a challenge to the panel. I'd interested, be interested to hear your response to that. And I guess it doesn't have to be either or. No, we should well, no, I'm yeah. trying to be provocative. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Because I think, I think, I think, I think, so we absolutely teach both. So obviously the medics, most of them do research projects. We clearly teach research ethics and then we teach. So I, I think, I think they both need to be taught. I actually think research ethics have been taught for longer, have already mm -hmm. been taught because there's the regulation about it. Mm -hmm. So it's a kind of, it's an easier, Depth. It's an easy well, Definitely true of medicine, but is it true of technology okay. and science? Mm -hmm. We wouldn't, we don't teach research ethics at undergraduate level. I'm so glad to see there's at least an example where we're pushing for this, for it to have an ethics component as part of our capstone project, as we call, we call our final year dissertation, which has just been going through committees and getting caught up in university bureaucracy. But I think it's so important and actually not just not just for, for projects that involve human participants but <laughs> others as well and um, I suppose at a technological university we're not in the same situation most of our students do go into professional practice we teach research ethics um at at, at, a, at a post grad level obviously and all our PhD students have to take that but I think it's it, it probably it, it needs a shake up <laughs> for, for these kind of things right? we're still very much focused on uh, you know, the very sort of traditional and the research methods and, and, and then the steps and so on that, that people go through. And now there's very much more really specific issues that, that should be taught that aren't, you know, that, that aren't part of those traditional research ethics curricula. And I think, you know, that definitely is an area that should be, should be part of this discussion. Patricia, did you want to say anything about the comments about African countries being impeded, perhaps, by, by some attempts to kind of make it more uniform and, and the independence to do what a particular country believes to be best is beneficial. I just wondered whether you had any thoughts on that. Okay, sorry, I was saying uh, my network was actually on and off. But uh, I want to talk about data integrity. You know, data integrity is very important when it comes to AI ethics. Because you can't talk of uh, developing a good AI model without using the right data. Now, we find out that in Africa, most of the AI models that are developed, we normally source for our data externally. And by the time you use external data to develop AI model and deploy AI model, they are bound to fail. They may fail because you did not use the right data sets. So when it comes to different countries, I believe the neural network is neural network anywhere. Deep learning is the same thing. Uh, uh, machine learning is the same thing anywhere. It can be applied anywhere. But the data set actually matters. And I want to also uh, talk about um, the, the need for, for, for communities to be considered when these AI models are being deployed. So we shouldn't develop a model and impose it on the community. It's also, it's also good to look at the communities that will make use of these models. And you need to also put that trust in them. You need to also make them to believe that the AI model you are developing and deploying are trustworthy. Things that will make them to accept whatever you are going to deploy to them. And you also have to consider their privacy when we are, when we are developing these uh, models. So these are the things that, that we need to look at for when we're developing models, AI models in Africa. Africa, you know, we need to consider our uh, et 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 ethical background when developing these uh, AI models. So data integrity is very important. That is what will make us to develop 
AI models that cannot fail, but they can fail. But if you use the, the right data set, just like I said, I believe that uh, these models will not fail. Thank you. Thank you. Probably have time for just one more question. Do you think? Is there? Yes. Okay. Yeah. okay you go ahead. Sorry. I'm, I'm... Uh, I just want to go back to what Joanne said uh, uh, about, you know, the about the professional uh, groups such as ACM and, and IEEE. And I, I want to uh, compliment uh, in a way that I think uh, universal, you know, um, recommendation on ethics of AI uh, would, of course, very important, such as the UNESCO. Uh, trying well on the other side, I think as educators in this field, we, we we also have to realize the vertical trying, the value of the vertical triangles, like personal information protection uh, laws all over the world, uh, like the um, uh, algorithmic recommendation uh, uh, specifications, and also the the you know the deep generation. Uh, specifications and these are all relevant to a vertical domain of ai well it's actually concrete enough so that we can uh, ground those technical considerations into into reality uh, instead of you know having a more profound uh, framework where you find you know for those words it's very hard to concretize them into the uh, into the into the systems. So, uh, so as as um, teachers in, in in this field, I think uh, it's essential to um, to some extent to use AI as an umbrella term and to bring all the related uh, topics together and some of them as vertical domain applications to the idea and then go into the details. Uh, I think that that's very uh, important. Thank you. I think since we started five minutes late, we can take one more oh. question and, and then we'll stop. <laughs> Sorry, thank yes, you. yes, please go ahead. Yeah. So I have a question for uh, all the educators here. I think, um, yes, I mean, um, with, with, you know, ethics in medics and in department of the internet, um, stories are fairly different because when AI comes along, the impact is huge. We, if we break down all the, you know, uh, human groups, we look, we're looking at the designers, we're looking at content generators, we're looking at today, even the children are impacted. It's not only just, you know, using, you know, how we're going to develop product, create, generate uh, content, uh, make, make it safe and useful on the, uh, for, for our people. It's also today, the information that's pushed in front of the children, for example, they are, you know, we, we, they need to be told, you know, what kind of information they are receiving, what kind of risks, what kind of like, you know, safety that they will be looking out for. And interestingly enough, I think the AI education is becoming a bit larger, much larger issue now, nowadays. Um, not only the students in the university, it's, it's, it's all the different groups, you know, company product code, for example, mm -hmm. product policy, mm -hmm. they need to have something in place like that. So today, I'm not sure if educators here have thought about how we can extend this education into other groups of users. You know, mm. user group that affected is more, much more bigger issue mm. these days. Yeah. Children, when they, for example, I have seen, seen children receiving something from Chat TV, they are aware that's probably not right, but they're going to use it anyway because they, they can't be bothered to double check to verify. This kind of like, uh, I mean. Was it means unfortunate e events? Those things can only be, you know, stopped by education. You know, we we, we need. To, I, I'm talking about student education. Yeah. That's in much in the younger group. So yeah. I have. So I'm, I'm not sure if anybody here has thought about how we're going to extend this education to much larger group, especially the young ones. It almost sounds as if that's an issue for the second session, which will focus on, you know, how should things yeah. be different going forward. So maybe. Yeah that's a good place for us to finish because that's a good link between some of the things we've discussed here and some of the things we'll be looking at in yeah. the next session because this one is sort of reflections on what we currently do but I think what you're moving towards there is what should we do that's different and, and how can we extend what we do yeah. which I think is is, is crucially important.